Well, hello and welcome from Richard Hill and the Mind Science Institute. Here we are another week. What's interesting? What's happening? Now, uh, I suppose in the what's happening preempted uh, as I've been reviewing my work on interpersonal neurobiology as I prepare for a series of workshops in Melbourne and Sydney through PDP, which uh, we'll leave you the, the links at the end through the, the professional development program. And uh, so interpersonal neurobiology is, of course, a really interesting uh, uh, examination and work into the nature of the way the human being and the mental state and the affective situations that we all talk about and work with relate to the nature of our engagement with others. That the growth of self and the growth of mind and brain is all to do not only with the inward development of ourselves, but also the outward engagement with others. So interpersonal neurology is really good. Dan Siegel, of course, one of the leaders, uh, Alan Shaw, Lou Cozzolino, uh, Diana Fosha, uh, Pat Ogden, all these really great, uh, uh, Stephen Porges, all these really great people. Uh, but one of the things that I was uh, referring to a little bit more, and I was reminding myself uh, uh, this wonderful book, uh, The Master and His Emissary, uh, by the uh, wonderful Ian McGilchrist. I was also you know, reminding myself a little bit with Brainstorm, uh, Dan Siegel's new one, uh, which has a lot of the material that he's had in, in, in uh, a lot of the other books and put it nicely in relation to the teenage brain. And I think this right-left thing is really important. Certainly we have the need to integrate front to back, top to bottom, bottom to top, body to brain, uh, also story, memory, um, uh, our narratives. And uh, these are important aspects that have been brought out in interpersonal neurobiology. But this right-left brain thing is curious. We get, we get sort of goody baddy type of stuff with this still. You know, that the, the right brain is the goody if you're into all emotional, if you're more female, if you're more caring, more concerned. And the left brain is the goody if you're more male and you're more uh, structured and you're more organized and you're more um, business-like. And nothing actually could be further from the truth of is who's goodies and baddies. I guess this taps into my, uh, the reason for that is the winner-loser world approach, which, uh, uh, which I talk about, in the fact that we keep looking for winners and losers. And it's not a matter of that. What it is, is what are the processes and how can we bring them together? It's integration that we talk about in interpersonal neurobiology. The disintegration that occurs because of culture and the integration, but also what occurs in culture is the confusion. And so sometimes we have to disintegrate in order to comfortably reintegrate again. Uh, so McGilchrist talks nicely about the, uh, the, the right side and the left side. And what he's really pointing out is that a lot to do with what we need and what we understand and how we can process the world and how the world is best processed comes from right-sided activity. And let's even put it more simply and talk about, perhaps we're talking about also not so much just right-sided, but non-conscious activity. And conscious activity is so often defined by those things that we can speak, those things that we can reflect on, and consciously reflect on, as in say, so therefore language becomes and left side becomes very important. But what I think is one of the nicest things to understand about right and left side, and the importance of their dual, integrated, connected activity, cooperative activity, is this right side is to do with the broader picture, the general, the overall. It's not actually about specifics and detail. In fact, the right side quite happily carries a number of possibilities and a number of um, uh, ambivalent, almost, uh, uh, possibilities as to what something could be. It's looking at things in context. It's looking at things as a part of the lived experience, of the lived self. And so consequently, we talk a lot about feeling felt. We talk a lot about feeling the other person's, living the other person's experience, which is a great reason why I advocate everyone should do six months to a year of acting, where they actually learn that it is possible just through the process of framing the context of our experience into uh, a particular place, which the, 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 the script defines, that you can become not only interesting aspects of the broader self, but quite surprising aspects and presentations of the broader self. The many me's that we create out of the I, depending upon our experience. 
So the other part that is very important is that the right side sees things in the context of the living experience and the left side sees it in the context of more the abstract, more the non-living, the inanimate experience. And so it is able to get things organized and move things through and get things specified. But we do need this integration with the right side where we see that in the process and we see it in the overall uh, the overall setting and the overall engagement. And what we get confused about, I think, in relation to particularly male-female exposure and particularly emotional nature of the right side, is we get confused about a sense of temperament. And that temperament, uh, which is about our sensitivities and our intensity, how sensitive we are to something and how intensely respond we respond to it, that what we do with this temperament is we confuse that with the sense of my, if I am sensitive and intense, therefore I am right-sided, therefore I am emotional, therefore I am female and I am good. Uh, whereas if I am less sensitive and less intense, therefore I must be more organized and I'm not so human, I'm not so life, so therefore I'm left-sided and I'm masculine and, and so on and so forth. Whereas actually the temperament can be a wonderful thing. If you are less sensitive and less intense, then that's an enormous benefit to your ability to be resilient and to, to cope and manage. But on the other hand, if you're more sensitive and more intense, it's enormously uh, uh, interesting in relation to your capacity to notice other things and to engage with other things and to see outside of your own context. But it also is something that forces you more inward and can be uh, terribly detrimental in your sense of traumatic uh, uh, management. Uh, so this right side, left side thing is about knowing what they are and then utilizing their engagement as an interpersonal way of understanding where we are in the context of our experience and then expressing it in a way that is functional and capable and effective. So if anybody wants to come along uh, to the workshops, pdpseminars.com.au, come in there and look me up. Uh, I've got uh, interpersonal neurobiology. Um, I'm doing some neuroscience again in Melbourne. I've also got later on coming up the mirror hand approach that Ernest Rossi uh, teaches. And as you know, he's my mentor. And also my own work on the mirror neurons in November. Check that out in Sydney. I want to see you coming along and learning about the curiosity approach and how we actually apply that into practice. So for now, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, don't forget, always go back to some of the great books and if you haven't got back to them, grab them. Uh, Brainstorm, really good. PDP seminars, uh, me, all those things. As I always say, be creative, be engaged, be now right and left brain integrated, producing wonderful selves and bye for now. Well, hello, Richard Hill from the Mind Science Institute once again, looking at what's interesting this week. And I want to continue on uh, in my little theme of the right, right side, left uh, side, uh, right hemisphere, left hemisphere discussion that I started last week. And this time I was looking at uh, an interesting discussion in relation to creativity, uh, right side, left brain uh, type of activity. And I was referred back to a, an article in Scientific American from 2013 by Scott Barry Kaufman, very interesting, talking about, again, this idea of is the right side all this really fabulous creative stuff and the left side all this rational, logical, organized stuff? And of course, like I was saying in my last week's discussion, it is important of the integration and the complementarity of these two hemispheres. Now, I like the way that he goes through and says it is necessary for the sorts of creative input that the right side, the more generalized, the more overall, the more contextual, to come then and to be listened to and engaged with from a left side organizational and focusing and attention making, and uh, then also creating the, the, the specifics and the detail of that creativity. And then, and uh, McGilchrist talks about this also in um, The Master and His Emissary, for the left side to give back, for the or, or for the right side to lift it from 
uh, lift it up from the left side and for the right side to rework it into the context and then for the process to the left and then the process to the right. But these things also, we know that the corpus callosum is an inhibitory process. It's actually allowing the two hemispheres to do their own work uh, without interference from each other. So these things are actually sort of going along at the same time. Uh, the difficulty is, I suppose, is that the, the left side does have this capacity to look as though it's observing the right side because we're able to be more consciously aware of it because we can speak of it. We can reflect on, oh, look, I'm being creative, I'm being this, I'm being that. Uh, we know from Jill Bolte-Taylor's wonderful talk about um, her left-sided side, uh, left -sided stroke that she was having the, uh, uh, and how she s would go into the right side and everything would be all connected and engaged to the point where she even felt like her body was, her arm was a part of the wall. But then, thank God, she said, for my left side, because my left side enabled me to be able to focus and realize that I had to make a phone call and I needed to survive. Um, so what she says, which is really nice at the end of her talk, is it's not about right side. It's not about left side. It is about what you choose and what you allow to be engaged. And when you start to work with right-sided stuff, there's a degree to which of what you trust. What do you trust of your creative capacity to simply allow the system to flow and for that system to flow in a favorable and creative direction? And this brings me finally and full circle to my curiosity-oriented approach, which very much starts with the, that's interesting, shift the, the mind the brain into a curious frame of mind, a, a dopamine, norepinephrine, you know, uh, rafe nuclei, that, that reticular formation, that thalamic burst. First of all, get the brain into that stage. Then look for the problem, absolutely. But what is the message in the problem? Left brain helps you see the problem. Right brain lets you see the message, the contextual relationship. Then, what do I create from this? And to some degree, what do I create from this? is the trust that we biologically and neurobiologically, and it's hard to, say, to, to specify this, but I think one can say spiritually, will move towards a positive, creative, constructive, well-being outcome. That is the principal desire of our, of our biology and neurobiology and our connection through the right brain to the to the greater context. So, having talked about those sorts of fascinating aspects, let's quickly have a look at a couple of things that are going on, and there are a couple of Gottman things going on. Uh, now, in the States, in Seattle, we've got the Siegel Gottman uh, Summit going on in uh, July 25th to 26th, uh, 25th, 26th. That's fantastic. Go along there if you're in the States. Now, but if you're in Australia, in Newcastle on 6th and 7th of November, there's Gottman Marital Therapy Level 1. And this is uh, not taken by the Gottmans themselves, but by wonderful representatives uh, of, the, of the Gottman Institute. And um, it's organised by Relationship Institute Australia. Australasia will have the connection on there. So that's a wonderful thing. If you're into your Gottmans in America, you go see the Gottmans. Here you see the wonderful work of the Gottmans. And one of the things that amazes me about this is that when you go to the, uh, to the, the workshop there and you're training, you get a 300-page manual uh, included in your fees. So that's pretty good. Anyway, from me, allow everything to come, to be differentiated, but then to integrate. And in that way, create and for us to be creative and engaged and have an experience that moves us towards well-being. As I say in my lectures, the purpose of life, to creatively participate in the experience. I wish you well. Bye for now. Well, hello everyone. Richard Hill from the Mind Science Institute bringing you another what's going on, what's interesting, what's happening this week. Now, I found a nice paper in Infant Behavior and Development talking about prenatal meditation influences 
infant behaviours. So prenatal meditation, the purpose of this and the way they measured it was looking at cortisol levels and the lowering of cortisol levels. So that's probably really the main point, is this need in our experience for more calmness, more centeredness, more relaxation. And in fact, this is where we do our work with mindfulness and uh, uh, in order to reduce the degree to which the past frightens us and the future scares us. So meditation in this case was the one that was used. They talk about in this paper and give reference to uh, those other things which we find are very good in giving us a sense of inner peace, inner calm, a sense of centering perhaps is what it comes from. There are a number of reasons why we get distressed and what brings us back to calm. Uh, singing is a, a well-known process for reducing cortisol and increasing uh, things like oxytocin, more of the, the uh, engaged and socially uh, positive uh, hormones. Audio relaxation tapes are even seen to be effective. Yoga and massage therapy, if you're looking at Tiffany Fields and some of her work. So I think the big message though is we need to be calm, we need to have reduced and uh, bearable manageable levels of cortisol in our system. And of course, we've got to have some uh, stresses because we have demands, but these over and excessive and chronic levels of cortisol. We need to reduce those, but it's also the message saying that we do, obviously in our culture, have a degree of increased distress and concern and, and worry, which particularly is still being felt by the pregnant woman by the uh, during gestation. So there's not only issues here of the benefits that we can get from um, meditation, which can certainly assist the problem, but then also the deeper problem of why we need to use these meditative processes in the first place. But while we're figuring out the, uh, uh, you know, those deeper questions, if we use meditation, we use mindfulness practice, we use focused attention, we use things like music, we use things like massage and yoga, those, those gentle stretching uh, and interpersonal uh, activities, that that will downregulate the existence of cortisol in the system, and it'll no doubt downregulate a lot of other things as well. We've got other evidence of uh, the impact of the, some of those things on anti-inflammatories and so on and so forth. So we also know that by repeated work with those, that there is changes that can occur in the brain and also in the gene expression. So let's do those processes and at the same time try and work out the deeper uh, meanings of why we have these stresses and these concerns. And so in the light of that type of approach of life, looking at that what we need to do is we need to discover what we're about and put in processes to give us some um, reclamation of our sense of self and purpose and calm and centeredness uh, is a wonderful price, uh, uh, workshop. We've got the workshop, and my friend Bonnie Badenock is what I'm talking about here. Bonnie Badenock uh, in Portland, who is particularly wonderful in her work with trauma, using interpersonal neurobiology and that sense of trying to, to reintegrate the, uh, the confused, the, the chaotic or the rigid systems that uh, get stuck or get out of control in our body, bringing them back into a harmonious center. So she has a, a final 2014 workshop, September 25 to 27. We'll have a link uh, on the, uh, below on this. Now that will be in the Pacific Northwest. So it'll be in Portland and Vancouver. And she does this wonderful work with her uh, uh, lovely colleague, Coe Scott, who I haven't met yet, but I'm sure he must be a wonderful person. And you'll notice uh, when you go in there, you'll see the opportunity to look in on uh, signing up on there. They're 2015. They have a year-long interpersonal neurobiology immersion course. And there's regular sessions where you get together, and then there's reading and processes and activities you do on the way. So Bonnie Badnock in uh, Portland, uh, if you go and join those things, say good day from Richard. And this wonderful idea that we need to do two things. We need to take actions, meditation singing, engagement, uh, gentle speaking, yoga, massage, in order to calm ourselves and reduce our cortisol. And then I suggest that we also look deeper as to why we are in these states of distress. And I wonder if there are ways we can change our attitude uh, and our approach to the world. And then, of course, I'm 
thinking straight away of my curiosity oriented approach because I know that does that but we'll talk more about that another time. For now, thanks very much. Go out there, be curious, be interested, be fascinated and let's see what we can create. Bye for now. <laughs>